When I first started recording this podcast, I didn't know where or how to publish on multiple platforms. Luckily, I found Anchor. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. First of all, it's free. You don't have to pay to use the platform, which is great for me because I'm a broke college student living at home. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And trust me, it's very intuitive to use. Anchor will also distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else podcasts can be heard. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So what are you waiting for? Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello everyone, my name is Jason Ramirez and welcome back to Season 4, Episode 3 of the Hit List Podcast. A podcast where me and a guest cross off films from our watch list and discuss them. I'm joined today by film reaction YouTuber, known as Honest Movie Reactions on YouTube, Che. Welcome, Che. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me here, Jason. Actually, this is my first podcast, so I'm quite excited. Thank you so much for having here, having me here. I'm excited for both of us, too. So before <laughs> we get started, I have, two, I have two questions for you. Whenever okay. you sit down to watch a movie, do you choose something new or stick to your favorites? Oh, okay. So as if you know, for my uh, YouTube channel, what I do is I am starting to watch movies uh, now only. So for a, a few decades, I have not watched many movies and I was not exposed to the Western <laughs> uh, media as much. So what I do each time is a new movie for me. And uh, sometimes it is chosen for me. And sometimes I choose it for myself, but it's always a new movie. Awesome. So for those of you uh, who are wondering why she is on this podcast, because that's exactly her background. I come from a background where I've watched movies since I was practically born. You know, I was like all around it. It was all around me. And to have someone on the show who didn't really grow up around the Western media as much, mm-hmm. who was an adult mm-hmm. when she started watching films, that's why I want, I, she's on the show for her perspective on these films today. My second question for you today, if you had to eat one meal every day for the rest of your life, what would it be? Oh, uh, I'm Asian, so I would love to eat steamed rice <laughs> with, <laughs> with anything. Steamed rice is my biggest comfort. So that will be steamed rice. Uh, with uh, Steamed rice. Uh, uh, st- yeah, steamed rice with uh, any accompanying dish. So that will be the best actually for me. I can eat it actually three times a day. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good answer i like that i like that for me uh i'm not sure but i found out recently and by recently i mean like two years ago that i'm lacto- lactose intolerant now so oh no yeah i hate that <laughs> because, because <laughs> oh no literally everything in the united states not everything but they make so much milk in this country <laughs> so much dairy that there's even like a cave full of cheese underneath like one of the states and I didn't even know that until like a couple of weeks ago. Like, wow, really? We have more cheese than the French? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, you have to become lactose intolerant to figure out oh my, how, how prevalent it is in the, each and every food yeah. that you eat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of the French, so that's uh, actually one of the movies we're going to talk about today. So the films we will be discussing today are Forrest Gump and The Duelist. Forrest Gump is a 1994 American comedy drama film directed by Robert Zemeckis and written by Eric Roth. It is based on a 1986 novel of the same name by Winston Groom. The story depicts several decades in the life of Forrest Gump, a slow-witted and kind-hearted man from Alabama who witnesses and unwittingly influences several defining historical events in the 20th century United States. The film stars Tom Hanks, Robin Wright, Gary Sinise, Mikkel T. Williamson, and Sally Field. This film was on Che's list. Why was this film on your list, Che? Okay, Jason, actually, this has been a movie to watch for me for a long time. This has been one thing that I've been wanting to watch for a long time, and I did not make the opportunity to do so. And uh, when you are watching this is when you really feel like you have been living under a rock because everybody has watched it and you haven't. <laughs> but but, but uh, it was proposed to me by my subscribers and also my patrons at our Patreon. So that was when I finally watched it. And But it has been in my like bucket list for a long time. Yeah, I will say it's, how do you say, it's part of popular culture in the United States. Mm. 
where even if you've never watched the movie, you know what happens in the movie. Exactly. But actually, the funny thing is, I did not know any of the characters. Like the actors, I had no idea who they were. Mm. And uh, so that was the uh, the first... This I think this is my first Tom Hanks movie, Forrest Gump. So that, that was really new for me. And... Uh, I, I was wondering after I watched it, why didn't I watch it before? But uh, it, it's really popular indeed. <laughs> no, I think this is your, might be your second because you saw Saving, Saving Private Ryan, right? Yes, yes, I, I did, I did. Uh, but uh, actually, the Forrest Gump came before and then uh, even though it was released uh, uh, earlier, the Saving Private Ryan. Oh, okay. Because you said you said it's the first Tom Hanks movie for you? Yes. Tom Hanks, he was in both. Yes, yes, ex- exactly. The, he, he was, he was in uh, Pri- Seven Private Ryan as well. But uh, in the, the sequence I watched, the Forrest Gump was oh. first. And, yeah. Okay, got it. That makes sense. Mm. Okay. <laughs> so what did you think of the movie? Because you say, you, I, I'm hearing high praises right now. What did you think overall? It's 10 out of 10 for me. It's a brilliant <laughs> movie. I, I, there's nothing to pinpoint for me. Like, oh, this could have been improved. Everything was put on from the script to the act, the performances, and uh, the the scenarios, the setup settings they had done perfect, and really kept me captured throughout the whole movie. And I really loved the way they did the narration because there is a narration going on from Forrest Gump's end uh, throughout the whole movie. I, I thought it was a brilliant way to do a movie. And with his uh, the southern accent, it was such a lovely touch. <laughs> I, I, re- I really loved it. And with Alabama, um, I've, I've never been to the U.S. But for me, I, I have watched a lot of documentaries about the world. So I did Alabama, it was so beautifully done. And uh, the, the storyline was such a unique one. And uh, I will talk about the characters, I think, a bit later on. So uh, when I watched it, I was blown away, really. That's one of the best movies I've ever seen. It's very emotional, but at the same time, it, it can make you... Like, the first half made me laugh. I, I was laughing my ass off. But then <laughs> uh, the second half, I was crying and crying and crying. I was like, well, look, looking at myself, why am I crying when there is a funny thing as well, going as well? Because there's <laughs> so much irony and symbolism. So it was a beautiful movie. Yeah, I will say Robert Zemeckis, he's one of my favorite directors. He directed Back to the Future and another movie Ooh. before that called Romancing the Stone. Oh, he, he he was the director for the Back to the Future. I love that one. Yeah. Oh. When you learn about this, you see like how versatile these directors are. He mm. is like one, I don't want to say classic filmmakers, even though it is from like the 90s and 80s. So his films that are like were kind of his peak. But it's the type of film that you don't really see much nowadays because the way he does his films, he always moves the camera to like where uh-huh. the focus is. If you, you remember in the New Year's Eve scene, New Year's scene when they're at the bar and if they they go from the crowd to Lieutenant Dan, that's that's one of his trademarks. Oh, ah, okay. Like you'll see some stuff and then go to the focus of the scene. Other directors, they'll like cut, like do different scenes and they'll cut like B-roll into it. Which isn't mm. like a wrong way to do it, but it's just more work to do the moving scene. Mm. That, that's what I appreciate more about it. And like you said, the emotional parts, he thought it would be popular in the United States. And it was. It's very popular to this day as well. And he thinks the reason why it did so well outside the country is because it's not just a story about America. It's a story about love. Yes. A story about uh, a man's love for his mother, mm. for his friends, for his uh, men in the military. And it's about grief as well. Things are universal to everyone. Exactly. Who is your favorite character in the movie? <laughs> okay, there are there are a ton of favorite characters. To be very honest, I I loved a lot of them for so many different reasons. But I obviously the main character Forrest Gump. I love loved that character because I've never watched a movie. Okay, here is a person who's talking who has not watched that many movies. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, but I've never I've never seen or heard of a character like Forrest Gump because he's a clean canvas. I've never seen a clean canvas and I love the way how they portrayed world issues and love, sexual abuse, and uh, the war and all these historical things that happen through a person who is um, like he does not have a biasness. 
he just he's like a newspaper back then not now back then newspapers <laughs> were factual you know there was no opinion opinion shared so he is like that and we see the world and the things that's discussed through this really clean canvas clean and clear canvas that's why i loved forrest gump's character mm. and because it's he does not make opinions he doesn't share any opinion he's like this is what happened that that is it it's like it's so <laughs> sweet you don't you don't come across that many people who are like that innocent in life so i think uh, my my favorite character undoubtedly is forrest gump but i can't say it. like it's not not the only one character i love the other characters as well like forrest gump's mother the sweetest lady i was like thinking i i, I would love to be her one day it is really 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 nice she's like she the way she hoisted her son who was actually special but to make him feel how normal he was it's it's beautiful because nowadays i feel like we all try to say oh you are special you are special but actually what people want to feel is normal you are one of mm. the normal people so the way she she did it it's brilliant love that character as well yeah forrest gump he has no agenda essentially so that's why he's kind of like a clean canvas like you said and that's something that you can see why people like him is because he doesn't really care what's going on he doesn't know what's going on because he doesn't really need to know he just needs to do what he wants to do and Forrest Gump's mom also a solid character and when she died that was like a, a very sad moment in the film and she, yeah she did everything for him she was very sweet indeed indeed like uh the way how strong she was was amazing like he doesn't she doesn't look like this strong person but she was this she was the one who built the foundation for Forrest Gump if not he would have been a very um like he, he would not have the confidence he had on him in himself he just aced everything he did because his mother was saying you are you are just normal the way when she said that i i may be missing the words but she was saying if uh the god intended intended all of us to be equal he will give all of us braces in our legs it was like really this be beautiful mm -hmm. how how you can actually build confidence in a child that way so in the film was there anything that surprised you yes actually surprising but at the same time it was hilarious for me it was when they dropped forest gum in this uh, these historical scenes like the, he was with uh, <laughs> president jf kennedy and there was president johnson and this uh, the racial issue in alabama I, i was like brilliant and it it was so hilarious when he showed his buttocks <laughs> <laughs> the wolf <laughs> the, the press i do, i do not know i thought it was brilliantly done because the way they actually connected it to the real scenarios in the world back then and especially in the us it was really well done that was that was surprising to me actually yeah so some of those scenes so for like the archive footage that they got for that they had according to robert zemeckis miles and miles of film to go through of like this old archive footage and they'll find a scene they'll find like some footage and see how to connect it to the film so when he meets John F Kennedy that's not at the oval office it's not in the office it's actually at the garden outside the office so they had to like rework everything to make it look like it was in the office some Ooh. of the some of the behind the scenes stuff looks meticulous because Forrest Gump not Forrest Gump Tom Hanks <laughs> the, the actor who played <laughs> Forrest Gump yeah He had to be against a blue screen and it was the first time he used blue screen. He didn't know what it was before because it was 1993. They never used that beforehand. And he's like, "Why why are we using blue screen?" And Zemeckis had to explain that blue is the only color on the, that's not available on the on the skin, like in, in any color of the skin. Ah. So that's that's how they ah. able to digitally rotoscope him into the image. And they'll have like the footage playing and they'll have him like try to sync his body with the movement of the person who was actually there and he had to do it quite a few times to make sure he got each moment correct. Oh, oh, oh okay. Th that's really interesting. It's good to know that it was the first time for the actor as well because when I <laughs> when I watched it, I was like this is brilliant. The I did not expect that. The first time I saw I was like mm, this is funny. <laughs> But then when when it when it kept happening, I was like, it's a brilliant use of the 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 like historical scenarios. But it's nice to nice to know how how it was done, uh, Jason, because I really did not know 
know that they use this blue screen and did this uh, whole setup. Was there anything else that surprised you um, beyond the archive footage? Oh, I actually wanted to know. This this is something I wanted to know whether the, because they had the Vietnam Vietnam scenes. I was wondering was it actually in Vietnam itself that they did this movie or was it in Thailand or Cambodia or something similar? So it was actually South Carolina. <laughs> ah, there you go. That's a, that's a <laughs> it was South Carolina. <laughs> I mean, really wouldn't be surprised. It's not just you, but like even Vietnam veterans were confused. Like they, they say it looked as close to Vietnam. It did. As they've seen it on screen before. And they even planted trees to like make it look like Vietnam. Whoa, it, it really worked so well because it's the tropical, uh, the the trees, right? And mm -hmm. the plants and all. So I, I was really confused. It looked definitely Vietnam. I My thinking was, yeah. was it done in like Thailand or Cambodia, which is actually border in Vietnam anyway. Whoa, I did not think it was in U.S. itself. But I'm not surprised because that's so good. Yeah, for me, one of the things that surprised me the most was when um, the principal left Forrest's house after like sleeping with his mom and he said something to him and then young Forrest, like the old case, like, huh, 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 like imitating <laughs> what he was saying in the house. <laughs> I don't remember saying that before, but I was like, that is genius. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the, you know the funny thing is actually if somebody asked me what are my like least favorite characters out of the movies let's say right i i know a lot of people will say that's this funny thing a lot of people will say it's like jenny but it is not for me i really like jenny's character and i i really sympathize uh towards her with what happened to her but actually one of the characters I wouldn't like is the principal because he really made mm -hmm. use of that whole situation. But it was yeah. it was absolutely funny when, <laughs> when he came up <laughs> and spoke to <laughs> for us the his only thing like uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite funny, actually. And, and the thing is, I don't think Forrest knew how much that could have hurt that man. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, like a buffoon. I don't know what he was doing. I just realized that, like, most of the characters I don't like in the movie are mostly men. I I didn't even realize until you just said it right now. Almost all of Jenny's boyfriends, I didn't like any of them, especially that guy that hit her right in front of Forrest. Uh, oh, in yes. that during that Black Panther party, oh man, because he was the only one that made Forrest yell. Yes, exactly. And uh, the the thing is, I think uh, the men Jenny was going for at that time were because she had lost confidence in herself. And I, what I see in Jenny's character is like she felt so insufficient and uh, in front of uh, Forrest because she knows how innocent Pierre and. A virgin he is actually so uh, for her it was not her fault uh, what happened to her when you look watch the movie it was actually what happened to her at home with her father exactly but which Forrest did not realize he thought it was a very loving father who was touching and kissing them all the time but it was something else that was going on so but Jenny took it so personally she thought she's this a uh, person a lowly person but I think the men who were with it, so she was getting attracted to these men who did not value her the same way Forrest did. So I think um, undoubtedly, yes, they treated her the way they were actually. But actually, for me, another couple of characters I didn't like, these are so insignificant characters actually, is uh, when Forrest first got his braces and he's talk, walking in the town with his mother and his foot gets stuck in this gutter uh, in the on the roadside and these two old men are watching it like they have seen this alien out of nowhere they're not even helping the boy <laughs> i was like furious you haven't seen a boy with braces just like the mother is asking like those are the characters that i don't like actually <laughs> <laughs> The most insignificant characters, even though you see them throughout the movie, they don't do anything but watch the movie, essentially. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. Like, they, actually, they, they just add a bit of a spice to the movie, but they are very insignificant. <laughs> but but the thing is that those are, those are the ones I don't actually like. What were you thinking as you finished watching the film? There was a ton of things going on in my head, Jason, because, like I said, when I watched the movie, in the beginning, it was really funny how it was portrayed 
and towards the mid and the end, it became such a, um, like there were so many metaphors, so many symbolism and irony in, uh, the, in the movie that was reflected through uh, Forrest Gump. So when I w finished watching, I was crying. I really cried so much. But I, I thought it, it was a beautiful movie that touched upon so many things that uh, really mattered to in so many people's lives. But it was portrayed in this special way through this clean canvas of a person. Like there was, there was a ton of things to think about. Like I was th thinking about Forrest Gump, obviously, because it was the main character and I loved the character. But at the same time, I loved... Uh, I, I will call him Lieutenant Dan because I use the British English, so Lieutenant Dan for you. But uh, his his character arc was really beautiful because his representation was more of what the war, how the war affected the soldiers, and the loneliness he felt, and the how left out he felt. It it was heartbreaking. It was absolutely heartbreaking to watch uh, Lieutenant Dan. And I, I love the character arc of Jenny. Th that is the beauty of it, I see. Like mostly, most of the movies, we see the character arc when it comes to the ma main role. Here, in Forrest Gump, <laughs> the Forrest Gump didn't change. He was Forrest Gump from get-go. He was this clean and clear person, and there's no character arc. He's like this straight arrow throughout the movie. But the characters around him had this arc that was happening like for Lifton and Dan and then at the same time for Jenny. So I really love this. It's, a, it's kind of a movie. After you watch, you, you can think for days actually what, what, was, <laughs> what was happening, what they said about the mother, how she raised him. There was, there was a lot of things that was going on in my head. It was a beautiful, beautiful movie, seriously. I will say one of the characters that resonated the most with me was Lieutenant Dan because when you first meet him, he doesn't he's not taking the war seriously as seriously as he should, like as kind of like the um, veterans did back then. I'm not too sure. Most of what I know about the Vietnam War is from like movies and from books as well. So mm -hmm. I don't know the full scope of what happened. I just know it shouldn't have happened. Just like most wars anyway. So he knew what his, he thought he knew what his destiny was. He was always chasing his destiny, which was to die in, the, in a war for America. And when Forrest saves him, he's mad at him because he doesn't know what his purpose is anymore. And he struggled for years to find his purpose. And he he's just, how do you say depressed he's frustrated at the world and you even see the frustration when he first sees Forrest for the first time in years when he essentially looks very homeless he hasn't taken care of himself and he says they gave you a presidential medal of honor he's like yes. lieutenant dan <laughs> you see how like different their responses are to each other like lieutenant dan is just so mad at him that Forrest is just so happy to see him again <laughs> yeah it's so sweet that uh, sorry to interrupt you jason it's so sweet that they uh, like lieutenant dan because he's so boiling with anger actually he's frustrated at himself not at uh forrest gump yeah. but he says they gave you an imbecile <laughs> this this <laughs> medal a medal of honor then he's like forrest gump yes they did <laughs> so cute, <laughs> so cute. <laughs> and then you see like his transformation afterwards like you see how forrest didn't really have to spend time with lieutenant dan i think he was there with him for like a couple of nights because i guess Forrest for Forrest, it was just to like catch up with him and i guess that's what really saved lieutenant dan from falling off the wayside because yeah. he had conversations with him that he didn't have with anyone else then you see him come to come to do the stripping business with forrest gump and you really see him finally like come to terms with himself with his own spirituality and by the time he goes to forrest's wedding he's walking on his own um on his own prosthetic legs and he's also like got a haircut. He shaved too, and he got a wife too. So he he really was transformed from like Forrest's presence in life. Even though at first it was like Forrest was a nuisance to Lieutenant Dan, he then realized Forrest was kind of like a blessing to him. Kind of like how most people in our lives, we don't realize that they're a blessing in our lives until later on in life. Yeah, and I I think uh, what happened to Lieutenant Dan as well because he was so proud. He came from this uh, like family where there was so many sacrifices to each and every war that Americans had fought for. So he was very proud and he thought he was the one 
who was uh, labeled for Vietnam War. When it did not happen, and he came back in in the in Vietnam, he was a lieutenant or lieutenant, and he had his orders and he had his team, he had authority, and he felt important, right? Mm-hmm. But when the war happened, I think more than him losing his legs, it was the biggest devastation for him was him losing his personality. He lost he who he was, the purpose, and at the same time, the self-importance. Then when he came back, that's why like he, he still wanted to hold on to that authority in such some way. The only way he could do that is with Forrest Gump because for him, no matter what, it was the lieutenant who was giving orders and he's the one who started the the Baba Gum shrimp business, but in the end, yeah. it was Le Lieutenant who was running it, right? So he liked that, but uh, I, I think it was pride, that pride. It was not like a really bad kind of a pride that I'm saying, but uh, it really helped him when um, Forrest Gump actually gave him that authority and that respect that he was really craving for after he left uh, Vietnam. And uh, yeah, like you said, he that is why I really like the his character, Lieutenant Dan, because he has uh, such a lovely character. Beautiful, really. Like, it, it, it gives you some hope because when he lost, lo- lost his legs, I really felt so sad. I was like crying the whole time. Yeah. So I know this movie has a very... I don't want to say sanitized the version of history, but a very twisted version of history. Did you learn anything new about American history by watching this movie? Uh, to be honest, Jason, because this movie is about the Vietnam War, so it is from the like the, one of the major things that happened was from the Vietnam War. So I have read a lot of uh, books and uh, watched a lot of a lot of documentaries. So even though I'm not I'm not a person who does not watch movies uh, because I was not exposed to them, I have watched a ton of a documentary on World War Two, Vietnam War, and all the other proxy wars as well. I ha- I think I knew a lot from there, but uh, that's that way. In uh, Forrest Gump, they did not try to address what was going on in Vietnam. It was just specific what was happening with Forrest Gump and his uh, teammates. But um, I actually found it very interesting when they, even though it was hilarious, when they dropped him. Mm-hmm. In this, uh, the historic scenes, I thought it was brilliant because th- that way you actually see re- actual footage, which, which is a bit distorted <laughs> to get, bring the, bring this person in. But that those things really happen, like the Alabama, the 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 racial the, that situation that happened when finally the black students could go to school, uh, where the white students attended. So those those kind of things, I I thought it was very interesting, um, but I do not see Forrest Gump as something that gives um, that much of uh, extreme insight to the mm-hmm. American history. But I, I thought it is a beautiful introduction for um, different people in, living in different uh, places, especially when eventually Forrest Gump, he did his three years run. So he goes through U.S. and certain different parts and different people, the people's different ideals. So ideologies and things like that, that's what I actually learned from the, from the movie. And um, at the same time, I watched Forrest Gump, and afterwards I watched a documentary about Alabama. And this house was there, it's about the planter's house. And he mentioned that his mother's grandfather's grandfather's grandfather came a thousand years ago. So they were actually planters in Alabama, and uh, they may have had slaves at the time. But um, I thought it gave cues if you want to learn a bit more about history so you know where to pick up and uh, actually research for it. Yeah, that's a very interesting point to that as well. I I was just thinking like there are some certain scenes that I think people who are from the U.S. or have studied U.S. history will like laugh at that because they know the reference behind it. For me, one of the scenes that made me laugh a lot was when Foros is at the Watergate Hotel and he saw some men like oh, with flashlights in the hotel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he says, yeah, I think you need to go do some maintenance because I think the lights went out. <laughs> That's yeah, what made me laugh a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it's like little moments like that, that like, that's what I was asking for. But I, li- I like your answer too. 
that like oh, they okay, they okay. twisted they twisted it around to like say oh that's what really happened you know for the story you know actually uh, Jason because like I said I've never been to the U S but uh, mm. read about U S history so it's yeah it's really interesting how how you perceived it but it, for me I really loved I thought it's so cute this this man is thinking they are stuck they are trying to find the switch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's something I also want to talk about because it's just a good film as it is. There are criticisms for, for this movie that I think are valid. I do share some of the insights for the criticism. I will talk about that later. But overall, as a film, it does a great job because, like you said earlier as well, the direction, the acting, the music, the music by itself is amazing. Because they, they got music from all across the decades of America. And they also created a soundtrack specifically for the film. And just the engineering behind the video effects. And how they set up like a revolution of digital visual effects in movies from the 1990s. All the way up to now. They kind of set the foundation for that in the 90s. So as a film, it's a very well made film. And it works. And did you know there was actually going to be a sequel made? Oh, really? They're still thinking about it? I don't think they're thinking of doing that anymore. But they were thinking oh. about it back then because the writer of the book wrote a, a novel because it's based off the book. And he wrote a sequel to the book. And the book starts by Forrest Gump saying, don't ever let anyone make a movie about your life. <laughs> so it's kind of like the real version of what happened to Forrest. And it's set in kind of like in the 21st century. And oh. those plans just never went through. But I think it's fine because it stands it stands by itself very well. I think so. I think so, Jason. Because sometimes uh, certain movies like this, I think... Um... It's difficult to nail a sequel, really, when yes. you have such a successful movie. It's so difficult. Very few movies have done that. I've been lucky to watch a few, like Alien and then Aliens and things like that. So they actually do justice to the, the initial movie. But I think Forrest Gump by itself is a brilliant movie, full stop. Mm -hmm. Some may be able to do it, uh, like elevate it. But I think uh, the way we watched it and most of the viewers may agree as well, you can't actually elevate it any further yeah. because it, it ended in such a sad note anyway. But at the same time, there was finally hope for Forrest Gump with mm -hmm. his little Forrest Gump, <laughs> the son. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's hard to top that movie. You know, it's really hard because like so many people already like it. It was so, like you said, so successful. How do you do, how do you like one step above it? How, you, I, I'm not sure how you could do that. I wouldn't know how to do that. Exactly, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So I guess now it's time we can talk about the behind the scenes of Forrest Gump. And I understand you have some questions for me about the production. Okay, actually, uh, the, uh, Jason, I had a few, a few questions. Uh, like one of the major questions, I do not know what Tom Hanks' age was. Uh, by mm -hmm. the time he was uh, acting this role, but uh, Tom Hanks acting, his accent, I don't think he's from, I, I do not know his background. Was he from a southern end? Like the, his accent was put on and uh, the way he weaved and I thought he was someone who's in his 20s when he was acting this. So that's, I was like really surprised someone who was in his act, the, like 20s had given such mm -hmm. stellar performance. Like, do you have any idea about, like, Tom Hanks, how he trained to become Forrest Gump character? Yeah, so, like you said, the voice for, for Forrest Gump, he was inspired to do that voice from the actor, the little boy who played young Forrest Gump. So, the young Forrest Gump character, that was his actual voice. That was the way he actually spoke. And there was a scene that was cut from the film, but they're kind of, like, both together. We kind of show, like, how they, like aged whatever and when he met him on set he's like oh okay so this is how he does his voice that's how i'm gonna do my voice so that's how he got the voice for southern accent accent as far as his background i didn't know this until i did more research into this but he was 37 when he made this movie and i, I knew who he's young but I, he was close to middle age at that point and he's been acting since he was at least 21 maybe even younger he first started out in theater and then he did movies he had done like 19 movies before he had done forrest gump some of them not in leads but he he's had experience well before Forrest Gump. That that explains because I actually I I really thought that he looked really young. I did not think he was yeah. in his thirties. No way. I really would think he's like twenty five, 
and uh, the, that's why I was like so impressed. I'm still impressed, even though I hear that he's thirty. He was thirty seven when he acted this. Yeah. I'm impressed that how he actually looked so young and uh, portrayed such uh, such an, a character. But at the same time, the accent. I I mean I'm a person who can't imitate a, a, an accent very well, so I'm really <laughs> impressed <neither>. how he, <laughs> I'm really <laughs> impressed how he did it. It's brilliant. Yeah, I'm just amazed by actors in general. I've tried acting a few times when I was younger. I found out when ah. I was 20. I came I came to the realization when I was 20. Maybe I'm not cut out for this, and so I went to directing <laughs> instead. <laughs> But but maybe maybe give it some time maybe it'll come come maybe, naturally maybe. to you <laughs> yeah I I got, I've got more comedic chops now I know how to make people laugh now so maybe <laughs> I do comedy <laughs> that, that that'll be good that'll be good what was your what was the second part of your question like what was his background yeah I I was just uh, thinking like was he from the South Carolina side I do not think so the the I don't the, think no, so the, uh, yeah the, not Carolina. The Alabama, because uh, the uh, the the way he spoke, I really thought he is from there, and uh, I I wonder how old was his mother, because the mother's character was there from when he he was young, all the way until she passed away. So she looked very old, and I think the way they did her uh, the makeup and everything is was really spot on. But then the actress was superb. I do not think I have seen her before in any other movies that I have watched, but um, mm-hmm. the way she transformed from a young mother to this old lady, I, I felt so convinced that she was this old lady, that she, but, but she would have been the same age from the, the <laughs> time they started the movie and they ended the movie, actually. It's just brilliant, actually. Do you, do you know, have, yeah. you, have you watched her, any movies from her? before no but my one of my film professors uh has talked oh wait she was in the amazing spider-man the one in from 2012 the one with andrew garfield i'm not sure if you've seen that movie but she was aunt may in that movie i've never watched a spider-man movie no i haven't oh. watched any <laughs> spider <laughs> i'm a person who has i'm excited for you to watch them i'm excited for you to watch them because I want to see your reaction to that as well so i guess if that's if that's not already on your list it should be on your list oh, is it I, I have not watched any of superhero movies. None. None at wow, all. So okay. I, I really think I should touch upon them because they're so popular and I, I really have not watched... You just put on the title video, first time watching Spider-Man, you'll probably get like 50,000 views in a week. <laughs> yeah, they, most of the people will, will not believe like, what? She's lying <laughs> for sure. But I really have not. Yeah, I, I can't speak for something. I have not watched it at all. None of them. So she... She's like one of those actresses that's been around a while. She's like someone in the 20th century. She was in a lot of movies. I'm not sure you you would have seen them anyway. There's one called The Flying Nun, uh, Smokey and the Bandit, yeah. Mrs. Doubtfire. Yeah, I haven't seen most of her films as well, but I do know I do know she was an established actor before mm. Forrest Gump as well. And she was also not as not as old either. She was around like 45, maybe a little older when she was in that film. So. I think she was able to portray Forrest's mother when she when he was young, and then later she was able to play old. Speaking of actors who can play young and old, you will be surprised. There's this movie called Citizen Kane. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. It's considered one of the best films ever. It has been proposed for me to watch, actually. Yes, uh, so yeah. many people have, have asked me to watch because I watch some um, Wild West movies. People uh, come through different different angles, and C- Citizen Kane is one of I think one of the best movies in from the American I think Hollywood history so they they really have been asking me to watch it's it'll be I, I'll be watching it sometime yeah I have not so far well I'll, I won't spoil the whole film but I'll give you background to it so the lead actor was also the director for the film and it was his first film he'd ever done and it's considered one of the best movies ever and he was only 25 when he made that film and he played a young man and he played an old man, like up until like Ooh. 60s, an old man. And when I saw that movie, I was like, he was 25 when he made this. And it was his first film. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it has to be a really, really good performance because everybody's saying you should watch it. This is one of the best movies. So it has to be. Yeah. And I don't want to give it too much hype. I don't want to give you too much expectations for it. But that's why I was impressed with that movie. And I also like it because it's very... It's still relevant to like media entertainment today, even though it was like it was like made like a hundred, almost a hundred years ago. (laughs) 
Yeah, that, that's that's a difficult one, right? Uh, like making a movie that can stay relevant to all ages mm-hmm. throughout years. So that is that is a tough one. But very few movies have done that. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any other questions about the production that you were curious about? Actually, I had a few questions which I shared with you before, and you had answered. Uh, one of the major things that I was curious is how they did that scenes of <laughs> dropping for yeah. stamp in the in the historic scenes that was uh, really brilliant to be very honest uh, jason when you mentioned about blue screen i had no idea about blue screen <laughs> if i were <laughs> tom hanks i would be like what is blue screen i only got to know green screen very recently so I, it was very interesting to know when you mentioned yeah. about this uh, the skin tone uh, the uh, the blue is the only color that is not represented in our skin so uh, the, that was one one question that i really had about how they made it and the other one was uh, did they, did they really film it in vietnam or was it thailand or cambodia that's where i was thinking <laughs> really i was yeah. so wrong yeah so green screen and blue screen they're like the same methods and people will either use one or the other depending on the costumes that the actors are wearing in the scene so if an actor let's say has makeup and they're supposed to be like a green alien. There's like green makeup. They wouldn't use a green screen because it will blend with the background and the elements might show up on their face when it shouldn't. So they might use a blue screen in that case. So it's really like the same method. It's just different color screen. And as far as like how they're able to like transport it to like different, how it looked like Vietnam, it's hard to notice if you're, if you're not really paying attention. But like the background, they added like mountains and other forest areas to make it look like it was Vietnam, but it wasn't. So like in that scene where they're walking down the path, yes, you can see like little mountains right there and like trees mm. that are native to South Carolina. They, that's how they added it in. And they did a really good job for 1994. They, you could tell the amount of passion they put into the craft for this film because it looked convincing. So in 1994, CGI was available. So, uh, so there was CGI used because I did not see it. I really did not notice it in uh, the, yeah. the 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 forest scene. I really was convinced they filmed it in Cambodia or Thailand or Vietnam itself. Mm-hmm. It's like a combination of things. So they use practical effects, stuff that is actually in the scene, with a combination of visual effects that they added in later. So that's like the best use of CGI. And the thing is. They were just starting to use this stuff because beforehand they had this different method of putting special effects in that was very meticulous. They actually had to work with the film. They didn't have a computer to do all that animation stuff. And it's hard to say it without like showing you what it looked like. But unfortunately, I don't have like the pictures. But Industrial Light and Magic, which is the visual effects company that was created by George Lucas to make Star Wars. That was the same company that worked on this movie, the visual effects for this movie. And so they revolutionized how they're able to do that. And there are some moments where it looks like there's no CGI, but there's a lot of CGI. So do you remember that scene when the two women leave Lieutenant Dan's apartment and he's on the floor Hmm. and how he swings around? Oh, yes. The furniture is not real. That was digitally added in. No, I did not notice because my my eyes were set on him. I was like thinking, how did they do with his... Because his legs are no more. I was like, oh, how did they really... How did they do that actually? Because he has no legs. And he actually somehow lifts him himself up to the wheelchair. But it cuts to a different scene because it was a difficult shot, I think. But uh, how did they do that? Uh, I'm like really confused in that one. That's a combination of computer screens and also blue screen. So they wrapped his legs in blue cloth so that they're able to digitally replace it in the post-production. So the the scene where he he's lifted up by the soldier out of his bed, there were holes in the bed and his like legs were like in the holes. And so when the soldier lifted him, he had to like lift him all the way up to make sure that when he swung him around, his legs wouldn't dangle and hit something else to make the shot unconvincing and then later on there they had to digitally add in like stuff over the holes to make it look like there's nothing there there's no holes and they had to replace like the um, the blue cloth on his legs to make it like replace with nothing afterwards and he added more bandages to that to the end right there so 
it's a it's a technique that's even I was like confused like how did you do that and then it wasn't until I watched the special features on like my Blu-ray player mm-hmm. that I was like oh that's that's a lot of work you guys put into this so it's a combination like practical and also uh, computer graphics that was added into that one and yeah. that scene yeah, so on the boat yeah no, what were you saying? No, exactly. The scene on the boat, I was thinking about, uh, again, when Lieutenant Dan was there, he again swings on top uh, on the edge of the boat. It's like, whoa, there's, there has been a lot of work going, going, going on to it. When The way you are describing how they do it. Whoa. So that one, I used to think that he actually like had to lift his legs over. But no, that little section of boat wasn't there. So he actually like swung his legs like normal. They just added in that chunk of boat afterwards. Nice. That's really interesting. Like I wouldn't have thought like I because I I watch movies, but I do not know about the production side of it. But it's really interesting. That that is one thing. Like I was not thinking about that. But but when you asked me if I have questions, is one thing that came to my head. Well, how did they do it with his legs? Well, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's something I've wondered for years as well. When I was. 14 over a decade ago uh i watched the movie for the first time i was like wait a minute i know it's not real but i don't know how they did it but now i know it, it's like something that it's still like some parts of the movie like the computer graphics still holds up to today some of them didn't but the majority of it did and it's good it's a good stuff that they had right there for the protesting in washington dc that one i wasn't sure how they did it because it is near, I don't want to say it's near impossible to fill up so many people like around that lake. It's not impossible, but the logistics of that is a nightmare. What they did is they only casted a few, like only like a few hundred people and they had them pictured in different sections. So like, let's say at one part, they'll be filmed like at the front and another part filmed the other side, fill up the left side and then the right side all together. And then they, they composited all the images together to make it look like they're all in one spot. And then they added ah. more CGI characters in there to make it look more full. Oh, I see. I think this this must be a technique that they may be using in other movies as well then because there are mm-hmm. some movies where you have like hundreds and hundreds of people. Then, you know, obviously they're not going to pay hundreds and hundreds of people to appear there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's really interesting. The logistics of that is it's a nightmare. Even for like the small amount of people, it wasn't a small amount. It was like a few hundred people. That's still a lot of people there. It's still, like I said, a nightmare because you have to manage all those people. It's a lot to handle. And even during that production, it gets very cold. And I'm not sure when they filmed it, but it must have been during the winter because it got so cold that half the people who were there left after lunch. (laughs) Because they couldn't stand oh. being outside for so long. <laughs> Was it? Oh no. Yeah, it, it's it's cold. <laughs> you don't want to stay outside in the cold for what? For a movie that you're not even getting me. It's like you're barely facing the movie. So why, why are you still there? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I would because um, the country that I live in is really hot <laughs> throughout the year. We have we have three seasons. It's like hot, hotter, and hottest. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for us, we will exchange it for any time. I will stay outside in the cold boy for a whole day if I have to, if I could. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that's kind of like a little bit about the visual effects on that. Did you want to hear about the controversy behind the author being paid? Sure. I did not know that. I actually didn't know this was from a book in the first place. I had no idea. Yeah, it's very different. It's very different. They had Have to you read it? Like 12 different... I haven't read it, but from what okay. I've read on Wikipedia, I can see it's very different. And there are some mo- things in the movie that don't happen in the book, like when he's running across the country. That doesn't happen in the book. Ah, oh, okay. This is a classic example of Hollywood accounting. And you'll, I think you'll like learn the concept, what, what, what I mean by Hollywood accounting after I tell you about this. So Winston Groom was paid $350,000 for the rights to the screenplay to like, just to make, sh- just to make the book into a screenplay. And he was contracted for a 3% share of the film's net profits. And net profits is like what happens after you like pay for everything. Unfortunately, Paramount and the film's producers did not pay him the percentage because they used Hollywood accounting to posit that the blockbuster film actually lost the money. Because when they did all the all these stuff, they actually showed even though even though it had millions and millions of dollars in the box office, they could say that they lost money so that they didn't have to pay him. Mm-hmm. Tom Hanks, on the other hand, he contracted for a percentage share of the film's gross receipts, not the net profits, the gross receipts instead of a salary. And so he and director Zemeckis each received forty million dollars 
Whoa. Yeah. And he also, the Winston Groom was not even mentioned once in the film's six Oscar winner speeches. So they won six Oscar Academy Awards. He was not mentioned once. That is sad. And he was really mad. Like, they didn't pay him his money. They didn't even thank him for the success. That is a rip-off. Yeah, yeah. So you see this happen, like, a lot. They make it so that they, they'll account that they lost money so they don't have to pay taxes. That's how Hollywood, all those Hollywood films look like. So if you ever are working on a Hollywood film, ask for like the gross receipts, I guess. Don't ask for the net profit, ask for the gross receipts. But this happened in the 90s, so maybe look more information to that. But that, that's something that I've heard happen, I want to say a thousand times, but I've heard it happen like a few times. That it's just unfortunate that it keeps happening. And so Winston Groom, the author, he had a dispute with Paramount. And it was effectively resolved after Paramount gave an explanation of the accounting. And they gave him like almost like a million dollars, maybe even more, to get the rights to the next movie for the for the sequel novel. So the, the sequel to happened. the book. Yeah, the sequel to the book, ha- it happened. Like the actual sequel book exists, but the movie has never happened. Yeah, it's been, how do you say, they call it development hell because it hasn't been made in years. Yeah, but but that is actually interesting to know, but at the same time quite sad because you mm-hmm. uh, take the concept out of this book and you owe it to the person who actually came up with it. And yeah. uh, if you do not actually uh, pay him his dues, which he very well deserved, uh, then that is that is really sad because this is uh, definitely a highly grossing movie and uh, the it's so popular to this date and it will continue to be popular. He should be paid in royalty, actually. He really should yes. be. Yes, and fortunately he did eventually get paid a lot. And you see this with... Like you said, you you don't you haven't seen superhero movies, so you probably wouldn't know. But a lot of the superhero movies get their story ideas from the comic books, and uh, men and women who wrote the comic book don't get the rights to the to the film. So even though it's not their character, it's not their intellectual property, they still wrote the story, and that sold a lot of books that made the the character mm. popular. And, but they don't even get the credit in the movie when they use that storyline in the movies. So, yeah, you see that happen to this day still. Yeah, because uh, like when comic books have been there for years, right? Like that's what we read when we were young and uh, before that and now. So uh, these are like old concepts. And I do not know how true to the comic book the characters are. Maybe mm-hmm. they actually adapt the character from the comic book and then uh, twist the story the way they want it. But again, like you said, because the character, the originality of the character comes from that comic book. And in that case, there is a belongingness to the person who actually came up with the idea. Yeah, that's that's quite sad. But I think I understand the reality of the world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and now a word from our sponsors. Now back to the show. So our next movie is The Duelist. So The Duelist is a 1977 British historical drama film and the feature directorial debut of Ridley Scott. It won the Best Debut Film Award at the 1977 Cannes Film Festival. The basis of the screenplay is the Joseph Conrad short story, The Duel, published in a set of six. The film stars Keith Carradine, Harvey Keitel and Albert Finney. So this film was on Jason's list. Jason, why why was this movie on your list? So I'm not sure if you know that I'm a filmmaker. So I was looking for inspiration for sword fights because I want to make a, I want to make a samurai short film in the in the near future. Whoa! I didn't know that. <laughs> That's yeah. interesting. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I do my best. I'm trying I do my best. I just plan out the movies first. So I was watching a bunch of like samurai scenes on YouTube and then the YouTube algorithm gave me this uh, a clip from the duelist, which is like the very first duel that you see where he's fighting like the mayor's nephew. Mm. And I liked it because it was one of the most realistic scenes I'd seen of what would actually happen in well, I'm sure what a duel actually looked like back then because the man was scared. Rightfully so, because you're fighting with weapons and you could possibly die from this. Yes. That's why it was on my list. And yeah. So the, actually, yes, like you said, the, the fights appearing in the duelist are like spot on how, how they did it. And I think there must have been a lot of research going on to it. 
and maybe experts who have come on board to help with help them with this real uh, sword fighting. But uh, the questions will come later. But uh, before that, I wanted to know, so who's your favorite character? Did you have a favorite character or if you didn't like a character there? <laughs> so at first, uh, I liked their French names. So I'm terrible with French. The, <laughs> <too>. the <laughs> main, I, I like the main character. I think his name, yeah, Dubert. I liked him at first. And I hated um, Ferrault. Fer <laughs> Harvey Keitel. <laughs> That's his name. Har That's his name. <laughs> At first, I liked Dubert because he was very fancy. Like I liked the way he spoke. Yeah, yeah. And I hated um, Harvey Gattel's character because he was just a pest. <laughs> he was just a bully <laughs> throughout the whole film. But afterwards, I was like, you know, I kind of like both characters because the reason this film is so interesting is because they're so different in their attitudes and like the way they see life. But overall, I like Dubert more than Farouk because he he just wants to end the fight, <laughs> and that that's what I, that's what I like about people when people who know that like the fight shouldn't happen and they do the best to like de-escalate, but they have to fight anyway. Yeah, I I agree with you actually. Yes, uh, sometimes when we start watching the movie, like you said, yes, you may dislike the character. Uh, initially because of the how may, blunt they may be or how arrogant they may look like snobbish actually but uh, eventually you understand why the character is so then actually you start liking and uh, sympathizing and empathizing actually more with the characters yeah I, I do agree with it I liked um how do you say I keep I can't say his name for road I'm, I'm just gonna say the actor's name Harvey Keitel's character because his case background is similar to mine he comes from a working class background and he had to work mm -hmm. his way up in the in the military because back then the officers were only from noble background aristocrats and, mm. and it wasn't until Napoleon came in that civilians could come in and, be, and also grow in rank so he was very much a huge a huge supporter of Napoleon and he had to fight his way up to the top. But he had a different method of doing that. And the reason why Dubert was able to grow up, go up in rank is because of the connections he knew. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. It's it's important because I think most of us will uh, identify with the latter person first. Because, uh, like you said, back then, the uh, wars, and the, I think until World War Two, even, the generals and the people the officers were mostly the aristocrats uh, they had the connections their network and the family and all this and that but uh, the, the rest were from the working class uh, the background had to be just the soldiers and had to be in the front line but uh, yeah like you said it, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting way you can how you can identify with the character with your background that's very interesting so when you, when you watch the movie, like you said, that you watched it because you wanted to learn a bit about this as what fighting and things like that. But were there anything that actually surprised you in the movie? Yeah, so there were a couple of scenes and it mostly had to involve the duels. So the second mm. duel between uh, the two men, the duelists. Mm. When he just pokes him with the sword and he starts bleeding and then the fight ends. Just as soon as the fight started, it's over. And that's what I was like, wow. <laughs> that was way too quick. <laughs> uh, you're saying the rapier, right? The rapier he used. Yeah, the rapier. Yep. The, yeah, yep. exactly. Mm. So that was the one that I was just like surprised at because it was just so quick. And it was, he, you even saw his frustration too. Like, it's over? <laughs> really? Come on. <laughs> he has been watching too many Hollywood movies. In real life, it can be <laughs> quite fast. <laughs> I think that's that's a, that's a good thing about this movie because they actually brought so much. Uh, like I have watched a few. Uh, there is there are some ch actually YouTube channels that I watch from the historians and especially from the UK and all um, about uh, sword fighting, and uh, mm -hmm. they have actually trained uh, professionals, and uh, it's amazing how fast it can end. If uh, we 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 are so used to seeing movies and the medieval times and so on, the fighting goes on and on. That's an interesting entertainment for us, right? But in yeah. reality, it can end so f so fast. And um, like you said, in this one, because they tried to make it as real as possible, they invested so much time and research to make it as real. Is I think that's why it 
uh, like you said this, uh, there were seconds uh, the fight started and just in the, it ended <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah and the other scene was when they're in like that little tunnel it looked like a tunnel mm. i think it was mm. just like a barn and yeah. they're tired and they're still trying to kill each other. <laughs> they're both bloody, oh, yeah, and they're it's still bond, trying bond. to fight each other. Yeah, 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 the barn. Yeah. yeah, and it gets to the point where like they both can't keep fighting, so they just like, like try like wrestle at the end. <laughs> I was like, okay, guys, it's over. <laughs> it's over, guys. Come on, stop. <laughs> <laughs> But but it's a concept that we actually sometimes don't understand this the that this dueling right it's a mm-hmm. concept that we really do not understand. I, it was like a question for me when I watched it as well. What the what the heck is going on? Why are they fighting all the time? This is this honor and this, this dueling, the whole situation. But uh, it's it's really interesting. I think the movie wasn't a very long movie. It was about one hour. An hour forty. 40 minutes yeah so that's so that's yeah, i think it's minutes, it's yeah. a yeah it's it's a very decent time for a movie because it can mm-hmm. keep you so in, um invested and then it just g- it takes you through the movie but once you finish the movie so w- w- what were what were your thoughts when you as you finished i was just thinking finally like <laughs> you found a way to like stop it <laughs> you found a way to like he didn't have to <laughs> kill him at all he's he, just like the model, like he said, you've been a pain on my side for the past 16 years. Now I have you at the end of my gun. I will treat you like a dead man so you can never bother me again. I was just like, finally, <laughs> you could have let this go <laughs> years <know> ago. <laughs> From the very first moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you felt relieved. You felt like you were the one who was tortured for 16 years. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you kind of see this in... um. And even today, like, some people, they call it beef in America. Like, oh, you have beef with me? Which is like, oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. you have, mm. yeah. And it's like, no, dude. I, I, dude, I bumped you, bumped into you by accident, okay? I'm, I apologized. I'm going to move on with my life. <laughs> that some people will just, like, are just insecure. Like, mm. um, I, I'll even say this today. As I've grown older, I realized that the most dangerous people in the world are insecure men. You see this with like people in positions of power. Mm. Uh, I'm going to say his name. You see it with Putin as well. Uh, unfortunately, with the stuff that's going on right now. And you, you see this in this film right here. The antagonist of the film. He's he's kind of at war with himself. Like he He's not satisfied yes. with mm. anything. He's not satisfied when he beat the, the mayor's nephew. And he's not satisfied. Mm satisfied after like the first duel or the second duel or the third duel he has to keep going so that's kind of like my own deeper meaning to this like just just let it go <laughs> you don't need to go yeah yeah the, what, what you're saying is really true some people it's uh what they come at us it's not that they have something personal with us but they have things to sort out themselves and yes. it's their own insecurity it's their own confidence issues but so they are sometimes really capable like in this movie but they are not convinced and they are not happy with themselves like, like you said that's really true but i actually have a few questions on this in this movie yeah. because it's again like i said it's something when i watched the movie i thought it was uh, uh, like a, the concept of dueling is something mm. very uh it's not we we watch movies and when we were young as well we watch sword fights but not this dueling and the whole concept they try to brought bring upon this uh, like dueling and respect and honor that kind of a situation like uh, do you have like any information on the history of dueling how how this actually started it's one of those things where, like, I've known about it for years, but I never really did research into it. It's it's even parodied in some co- um, comedy shows that I watched as well. He said, you offended me, sir. I demand satisfaction. And then the other characters, wait, do you want him to have sex with you? No, no. What? <laughs> <laughs> I, what I do know about it is, like, what I've read about in Wikipedia. So mm. I'm just going to read what I have from Wikipedia right here. So the concept of dueling. In Western society, the formal concept of a duel developed out of a medieval judicial duel and older pre-Christian practices such as the Viking Age, Holmgang, which was how they settled disputes, which is like a similar to a duel, but like mm. the Viking Age way. In medieval society, judicial duels were fought by knights and squires to end various disputes. 
By the outbreak of like World War One, dueling had been made illegal almost everywhere in the Western world because it, it was widely seen as like what they called anachronism because it was mostly done for people in higher rank and higher higher society or whatever. So let's say a one man offended another, like, oh, you offended me, sir. Uh, I'm going to list out the ways you've offended me and I demand an apology or sa- satisfaction and they'll fight to like regain their honor because maybe they're embarrassed by the interaction but they don't know how to like regain the honor after that. Yeah, they can't just say a simple sorry. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> just move on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you do not have to kill each other. <laughs> Express your feelings and apologize <laughs> and ask for an apology. This this is another thing, Jason. Like, they just popped in my head. Like, we are we have become a lot more vocal people lately. It has been accepted to be okay to be vocal about emotions lately but previous times it wasn't mm. um like uh, you you wouldn't actually vocalize your emotions mostly so especially if you are sad or if you are feeling down you will never say i'm depressed no right, right. or you will you will never say i was hurt because it was something to do with pride at that time so the people thought yeah. sharing an emotion with normal per- a person speak I think people, even in the most intimate kind of situations, like like intimate as in, like let's say spouse to spouse, may even not share their uh, actual emotions because of that pride and the way it, the world actually worked. Maybe that's why they did not actually apologize. Apologize. Maybe apologizing was deemed as something weak. So yeah. maybe that's why they had to actually fight. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point. And you're right. It's a it's a recent thing too. It's more acceptable to express your feelings and stuff. And I come from like a stubborn family and I find myself still being stubborn to people like, oh, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. No, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Actually, uh, like for me, the same. I uh, The way I was brought up uh, and uh, I, I studied in a convent. And there, but I'm a Buddhist myself. But uh, I, I studied in a Catholic convent. It was run by the nuns and we had a mother and it's very strict you know, so you are not actually supposed to be emotional. You are supposed to mm. hide your emotions. And you are supposed to be more functional, resourceful, not not address about your emotions and waste time. That's how, how I was brought up. So it's, yeah, sometimes I, I also feel like when I, when I see the younger crowd, so I'm not as young as you, obviously. And so they, they, when, when, I, when I see the younger crowd, uh, the way they are expressing their emotions, then I find a, a, a big difference, actually. So the difference in age may be a decade, but a huge difference the way they vocalize it. But I think it is good as well, because not everybody is able to bottle up and then just mm. go ahead. Yeah, we went from dwelling to emotions anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you, you're not 25? <laughs> I wish. A decade ago I was. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of like dueling, so it was mostly like people of like the same rank who are, who will duel each other. Because if someone was like of lower rank, so like let's say a general wants to challenge a duel with someone who is like a private or like an entry level army person i don't know these military terms they couldn't do it because that was illegal like why why are you picking on that small man he he's he's only a private like you can't do that so that's why you see in the film dubert was frustrated like what rank is he he's captain oh he's just like me (laughs) so that's why he was able to challenge him to a duel because of their same rank but by world war one it they said no no more of this because a lot of them were trained and they were like funded and trained by the military to go to school, to become an officer, and then to eventually like do war, essentially. So why are you fighting each other, <laughs> killing each other? So essentially like we're wasting money on these young men who are doing this. So that's why it became illegal. That's why it was even legal back then. They, sh- mm. they should have been court-martialed, but because they are during the Napoleonic War, they couldn't really fight it against they couldn't be court-martialed so it was looked down upon essentially for like a while even like before world war one so i'm not sure if you're familiar with the musical hamilton 
but it's based yeah. off one of the founding fathers of of the United States of America. He was the the first treasurer of the United States, and he had a duel, and he died in that duel. And、Ooh. it was like the early nineteenth century, so like early eighteen hundreds or so. And even by then, it was looked down upon because he had to go somewhere else to go have the duel, so they wouldn't be caught. Oh, okay. I did not know that. That it's very interesting. I had no idea. After this, I will research about it. Yeah, but but、uh, also、uh, looking at the movie,、uh, do you have do you know any information on the costume designs? Because I think they the way they did it was like. Beautiful done, and it looked so authentic to the time. Yeah, so Tom Rand was the costume designer for this film. From what I've read, it's probably、like、one of the most accurate costumes to that era because even the hair, the way they had their hair, was accurate. Because、mm. Harvey Keitel's hair at one point he had like a a little ponytail towards the side in like the first duel between Dubert and Farouk,、mm-hmm. and it, it was just like small details that they noticed that it was all. Very accurate, according to my resource, my sources, and he did such a good job with this. He was even hired to do other films around this era type of film, and he was hired to do The Counts of Monte Cristo in two thousand two, based off his work in this film. So it just goes to show that if you want, if you want to get work, you got to do a good job, have a good portfolio, so that maybe thirty years from thirty years from now, you have a job because of something you did thirty years ago. Yeah, yeah, actually, actually, it's very true because I also noticed the costume designs were really、uh, authentic. Because, like I said, I have、uh, watched and followed a lot of these、uh, documentaries, and then、uh, people who are specializing in the these kind of costume designs, the periodic costume designs, and I thought the amount of effort they have gone to and、uh, to it is amazing, and to and to know that this was a、uh, Ridley Scott's first、uh, feature film, right? So, yeah, he. I think, okay, undoubtedly, he is a genius. His movies. I watched、uh, only another one movie from him, Alien. So, but、uh, mm. impressive. The the the. But the, it's totally different, Alien, and then you 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 see <laughs> yes, the dual is、definitely. like absolutely different. You can't even believe this、Completely. is the same director. Yeah, exactly. So, but、uh, the, I was really impressed by the costumes. But one thing, because Jason, you are into the movie production that you said, right? Like the direct、mm-hmm. you, to directing movies. So I would love to know if you have any idea about how the cinematography and the、uh, the filming techniques of this movie, because oh, there were some beautiful scenes that they had used in this movie. But、uh, like any information that you have about the the filming techniques there. And the cinematography and so on. Yeah, so Ridley Scott, he had a lot of experience before this as well. This is his first film, but not his first production in a way.、Mm. He had directed、mm. close to a thousand to two thousand commercials before this movie, and、Ooh. he wanted to direct a film.、Ooh. Yeah, it's impressive. <laughs> he wanted、Whoa. to make a movie for decades at that point, but no one was gonna give him any money, so he just. He didn't write the script. He kind of got the idea from like the short story, and then hired someone else to write the script, and then he was able to get funding for this. But it wasn't a lot of money. They they only had like a million dollars for this movie, which is not a lot for this type of movie for like a peri- periodical drama. That is very little money. But he used his experience in like production design and directing to make sure that you don't really see too much outside of what's going on between the, the two characters and what what else is there. Because they had little money, they didn't waste money on sets. All the places you see in this movie are real. So all the like the ruins. Other locations, they're actually based in like France and other parts of Europe. So it was all real because they couldn't afford to like build their own set. That's、uh, I'm I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you there because you mentioned about the the budget. Because for me, when it comes to the dualist, it's a beautifully done movie, like done to perfection with the techniques, the costumes, what they were trying to discuss there, and、uh, it may not be everybody's cup of tea. But you said it's one million dollars. Yes. For the nineteen seventy seven, it may sound like、uh, quite a lot, but I watched another movie recently from nineteen seventy seven that was a bridge too far. Okay, that is the World War Two movie, and that movie had twenty five million dollar budget. So that was another epic movie actually. But、uh, yeah, just to think, in the same year, 
these two movies came one million dollar and 25 million dollars i think he did amazingly well for the budget he had yeah i wonder how far he went with the budget <laughs> so it was so tight that keith carradine the man who played dubair said that one one of the horse-drawn carriages had the back half painted red and the front part painted black so it could double as two different vehicles in the film. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I know. I, I, we didn't notice that though. You you can't. No, notice. I never. I, no. <laughs> if yeah. I if I didn't read that, I never would have noticed. <laughs> it's. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm thinking about no. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's awesome. And as far as like the cinematography, just like my long answer to get to the cinematography part. So the hallmarks of his visual aesthetic is with like stylish silhouettes handheld camera work lens flares and soft light so they used a lot of natural light for this film because they had a lot of influence from stanley kubrick's barry linden another film that's like based around the same era and then stanley kubrick was inspired by like real life paintings of that era so the way stanley kubrick shot his film was as if it's from the painting itself and so they also took that inspiration for the duelist as well so that's kind of like how how he went about the cinematography like how it will look like in a painting in the indoor mm. scenes and the indoor scenes were mostly with natural light and for filming techniques ridley scott had like i said he's been doing this for quite a while over a thousand tv commercials he knew how to handle a camera by then so he operated the camera himself most times and he used like a handheld camera to get close to the action so like the first duel that you see between dubert and Farouk, that's him actually holding the camera and he had to dodge the <laughs> he had to dodge the swords as they're like he's getting too close he was actually talking to, directly to the actors while filming it so like say okay another one another one oh <laughs> <laughs> Could have been annoying the actors though. <laughs> <laughs> like, did did they actually bring the the like specialists and uh, actual for the? I think they must have had the specialist for the fight with the choreography and uh, how the dueling is done and so and so because they looked absolutely real and like you said it disappointed you that it ended so fast as so <laughs> the second one, yeah. <laughs> William Hobbs was the fight director. He's also a fe- he was also a fencing master and stuntman. He choreographed the action sequences for the Duelist, and he had also done other films beforehand. So he done the Three Musketeers, and then he was also he was approached by Ridley Scott to choreograph the fight scenes for this film. Here's a quote that he told Hobbs: "I don't want any of that old tosh. I want it real." Scott told Hobbs, as quoted in Richard Cohen's 2010 book by the sword he said quote from the beginning i want to break away from all the hollywood stuff i've seen what interested me was the story the drama i was excited by the people the pauses that we put in the fights in the duelist were phenomenal but we wanted to get across the awful feeling that you believe you'll be dead on the floor in the end the realism is the fear mm, interesting that's this is really really interesting there was sorry what what was the gentleman's name again uh william hobbs william hobbs okay a few more fun facts about the fight scene so i want to verify this because this sounds almost too dangerous to be real but according to ridley scott both keith carradine and harvey Cattell insisted upon using real saber swords for the sword dueling sequences the swords used by the french hussars in the first part of the movie are, are all english 1798 pattern like cavalry sabers so they insist on using real swords I'm calling bogus on this one because that is way too dangerous to do and you're having the talent fight each other doing that but this is in the director's commentary and I haven't had a chance to listen to the director's commentary. I think I think they may have used it the real ones uh, Jason because uh, once you get the real one yes the actors become humans as well right then you know what you are handling <laughs> can be quite lethal but uh, maybe they actually had a lot of training by the uh, the choreographer and uh, William Hobbs and then at the same time maybe they actually invested a lot of time to learn this because you can see the way the actors uh, behave uh, the way they keep their uh, hands the body the movements Seems like they have done a ton of training on that. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they actually used the real ones. I just say because like even for that training, accidents happen. <laughs> accidents still happen. So I'll have to do more research on this one. Uh, hopefully this will be mm-hmm. in the in the show notes because this is according to the director's commentary to the film, which I haven't really listened to because getting a copy of this movie on Blu-ray is 
for some reason very expensive. I, I didn't mention this, but get, guess how much the price for this movie is on Blu-ray. I have no idea. Hundreds? Uh, yes, actually, yes. <laughs> it's $129 for a Blu-ray copy Whoa. of this film. No. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> no. As opposed to two ninety nine on Amazon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but then if you have the copy then you can keep it for yourself yeah yeah for this podcast i like to borrow a copy from the library because they usually come with special features and director's commentary into how the film was made that's why i know uh-huh. a lot more about forrest gump because they had a lot of special features ah. that's why i i'm an advocate for physical media like buying your own dvd and blu-rays like i'm not sure if you can see my 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 shelf right here the top shelf right here that's the front yes. row and there's a back row behind the shelf of like DVDs and Blu-rays. Oh, nice. But for, for the line of work that you are in, Jason, I think that is a good investment because that's uh, you, it is like your own library, like you said. Yeah. <laughs> then so your friends can borrow. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I think too. That, that's what I've been doing too. I know two fun facts. The swords were hooked up to batteries to produce the sparks in the barn. Ah, and Harvey really? Keitel was shocked a few times. He was shocked a few times. So that's why you might seem like jolts a little bit. <laughs> I didn't even know mm-hmm. that. I thought they was just like added in. But they were actually hooked to batteries. And the scene where... In the very first fight scene, when he's fighting the, the, ne- the mayor's nephew, when he like yes. does like the sword thing. So they attached like a car antenna to the sword hilt so that it would retract... As it went into his chest. Oh, <laughs> okay, that's that's really interesting. But when you when you said about that they had the battery on, maybe it it actually worked well with the budget that they had as well, rather than mm-hmm. putting the effect later on. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> but I I wouldn't want to be the actor to get no. electrocuted. <laughs> or, I I think that's that's one thing happens as well, Jason. When you have a limited budget, you have to become creative. And the yes. your creativity flows. That is that is good. When you have big budgets, you do not have to be as creative. You can get all the specialists <laughs> and do everything. Let them do what they know, right? But if not, you have yeah. to become resourceful. And uh, this was a brilliant movie, though. Yeah, another film. Another filmmaker I know who was who does well with both big budget and low budgets is James Cameron with the Terminator. So with the first Terminator, they didn't have confidence in him and what he was doing. So they gave him very little money for it. Most of the money went to Arnold Schwarzenegger because he he was a star. He was like a rising yeah. star at that point. And even mm-hmm. Arnold Schwarzenegger wasn't too confident in the movie. So he worked really hard. James Cameron worked really hard to make sure this film worked. And it, you see it in the film. It worked. I loved it. And then five years later with the sequel and then they were able to add in all these new special effects... He was able to add it in because he, he knew how to spend it. Yeah, actually, when I when I watched Terminator, the first one, mm-hmm. I was so impressed how they used practical effects in so many mm-hmm. things because it was amazingly well done. And I think, yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger at the time may have been the star adding the... Uh, giving a notch up to this movie but the movie definitely scaled him up eventually because the movie yes. was a brilliant movie loved the music how they oh loved it but uh, I recently only I watched a uh, Titanic I have never watched Titanic that is really sad but wow. <laughs> from, from, <laughs> from James Cameron I wanted to watch Titanic when I was young and uh, because I come from a very conservative uh, background okay so oh, it's so difficult right, right. to it's it's so difficult to watch it so i i heard these movies like so steamy and everything super excited to watch this movie <laughs> and i was like <laughs> and uh, my cousin got the the, <laughs> the vhs at the time okay then we mm-hmm. were like finally the parents have gone out for something at night i remember it was around seven thirty. this was 1997 and then, like, so excited, sitting down to watch. And the moment the VHS goes in, it's like, <laughs> it's black and white. All you see is, and you hear the audio only. It was such an anticlimax. Oh. It was so sad. So I recently only watched, I think, two weeks ago. For this uh, February, the, the Valentine's, I watched uh, Titanic. Mm-hmm. So he had a huge budget there, Cameron, uh, James. Yes. Cameron. Right? That was a massive budget, but wow. It was a beautiful movie. <laughs> yeah. It surprises me because I have family members who live in El Salvador and Honduras who live in what we call the camp- campesinos, like the very poor parts. And when I was younger, 
even day had seen it <laughs> had seen titanic <laughs> yeah they so had. like they, they had <laughs> After after twenty four years of waiting, I watched it. <laughs> this, <laughs> last month, this month. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's fine. Like uh, you have the benefit of watching them for the first time, and that's something that I'm a little jealous about. That I won't have to. I won't have the experience unless I watch something that's like more obscure or something that's new. <laughs> yeah, but when I watched it, I was thinking, it's a good thing the VHS didn't work. Because uh, I wouldn't have been able to watch it with my cousins even because it was too too uh, too esteemy for my age at the time and like I said come from a very conservative background but uh, mm-hmm. then when when I watched it as well I'm like uh, I don't know how to watch this <laughs> I I could I wouldn't be able to watch it with my mother even now no <laughs> uh, about the duelist I think uh, like like I said I. I just want to speak about it from the director's point of view because what I have seen from Ridley Scott so far is only Alien at that point. And then when I watched The Duelist, it's like totally different. And mm. it's, a, it's, it's a very, actually one hour, 40 minutes. It's a small time for a movie. I, it's, it's a decent time, actually. And uh, I would definitely suggest, I I think... For a person like you, you said you watched it because you wanted to do your own movie and learn about this, how they did this sword fighting and things like that. It's, I, I think it is a very historically accurate movie, like the way they, the techniques used. If you want to watch something that can be as realistic as possible, I would suggest someone to watch this movie because it is as realistic it may because some people get really put off when it is not historically <laughs> accurate or if so, <laughs> something is not done this way I, I in my comments i sometimes see people say, oh no this movie was not historically accurate da, da, da. but this <laughs> this like some people get really put off by it but i think this this is a movie if you appreciate those kind of things like the research that has gone to it and all it's a really beautiful movie but uh, definitely it may put off some because uh, some people are like why are they fighting no or non-stop like you said <laughs> it's like a headache so like fighting 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 but uh, no i i think um I, I really enjoyed it you enjoyed it too right jason like yeah even though you actually started watching it for your own research i'm sure you may have liked it how, how did you find it actually when now when you look back it's a movie that you would recommend to someone as well yeah i'll recommend to someone who would appreciate the world building the production design and like the action because there's something there's a little bit of something for everyone in this movie Mm. so if you like action like i do you'll appreciate the action in this movie if you like the drama and the people going through their lives you'll like this movie as well that's what i think about this film it's a little bit of something for everyone but it may not be for everyone but it's just like there are small bits in it that you may like in each part of this film that's that's true i agree with you yes So that concludes our conversation today. Thank you so much, Chip, for being here. I really enjoyed our conversation. I know we had some sidetrack conversations, but it's always nice to have these sidetracks. I I like sidetracking sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for having me here, Jason. This is the, as I said, this is my very first podcast. I've I've never been in one. So thank you so much for having me here. And I really liked uh, our discussion and learned a lot of things as well. So after this, I can go research even a bit more, actually. One final question. um, Actually, two final questions. Were the movies a hit or a miss with you? Both the movies, definitely a hit. Definitely. Mm. Love both the movies for totally different reasons, but beautiful movies i would definitely recommend to someone who would uh want to watch quality movies i think forrest gum and the dualist both are high quality movies in my opinion i agree with you there they're very good movies that i should probably buy a poster for them soon so where can we find you on social media oh jason i'm uh, mostly uh, available in two platforms uh, the first one is i have my youtube channel so you can find me at youtube if you go type honest movie reactions if, if you type www.youtube.com slash c slash honest movie reactions that's how it goes so that if you can find me there or else i have all my full-length reactions over at patreon so if you go to patreon and look for honest movie reactions 
you can find me over at Patreon as well. Awesome. Well, that's all for today, folks. You've been listening to the Hit List Podcast. My name is Jason, and until next time, cross off a new film from your list. Thank you for listening to the Hit List Podcast. If you liked this episode, please consider giving us five stars and leaving a review. It really does help. You can also follow us on Facebook at The Hit List Podcast and Instagram at the underscore hit list underscore podcast. 